Medicare Advantage plans are quite popular today. In fact, almost half of all people that are on Medicare have Advantage plans. Now, for some people, uh, that's a very good choice, very good coverage. But for others, it's a lousy choice. And the problem is they won't realize it until it's too late. And so what I'm going to do in this video is share with you 10 problem issues with Advantage plans, and one of them is major. In fact, that's the one that would keep me from actually enrolling into an Advantage plan. Let's get started. All right, I'm going to share these 10 concerns that I have. I'm actually going to take them in ascending order. I'm going to start with uh, number 10 here, and that is Advantage plans are a pay-as-you-go system. Now, uh, I know all the advertisements and the agents that promote Advantage plans always want to talk about a zero premium plan, and that is true. Uh, about 70% of all people today that are on Advantage plans have zero premium. Now, when we have an Advantage plan, we're still responsible for our Medicare B premium, right? Medicare B premium this year is $164.90. Uh, I am shooting this video in October um, the 2nd of uh, 2023, so we don't know yet what the 2024 B premium is going to be. It should be out uh, any day now, but we're expecting that to go up anywhere from 10 to maybe $15 on a monthly basis. But the point is, we all have to pay uh, our B premium. A is zero, uh, B has a premium, and in order to be eligible for an Advantage plan, uh, we have to be enrolled in A and B. So we got to pay the B premium. And so it's a pay as you go system. All right. So that just simply means what? That means we have some co-pays that we're going to be responsible for. Now, there will be some services that will be a zero copay. certainly not the majority of them. Uh, there's actually some services that are going to be co-insurance. You actually have to pay 20 percent of cost of that particular service. And so it's a pay as you go system. So what someone does is they may be attracted by the zero premium, but they're also then assuming the risk of whatever health care services they're are going to need. Now, what happens is as we pay these copays, that takes us to our next item. Uh, these copays are going to be applied to the max out of pocket. Uh, and this is an annual uh, max out of pocket. So, what happens right now, most plans are going to be anywhere on an HMO somewhere between about two to four thousand dollars max out of pocket on HMO. Your PPOs are going to be anywhere from about four to seven thousand dollars. Okay, and that just simply means again, as we pay copays and coinsurance, they're applied to the max. And then once we hit the max for that year, uh, then you can put your checkbook away, put your wallet away because there's no out of pocket expenses once we hit the max. And so there's certain health conditions, especially cancer, where people are going to hit the max. In fact, I've had a hat before. I had a lady that got diagnosed with breast cancer uh, last year. Uh, gets diagnosed at the latter part of the year around September and within just a couple months she maxed out. She was on a PPO plan that had a $6,700 max out of pocket for the year and so chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, all those things are expensive so she maxed out. The problem was her treatment was not over by the end of the year and so these max out of pockets reset every January and again she had to meet that max out of pocket again and she did. So literally within about five or six months she had maxed out two times from one year to the next and spent $13,400. And so we have to be comfortable with the fact that if we do have a serious illness, more than likely we are going to hit that max out of pocket. And so I want to just read something to you that I received from a gentleman, one of my clients, and here's what he said. He talks about a, a, a cancer diagnosis that he got, um, and he says, I began six weeks of daily radiation treatments and ke chemotherapy uh, weeks one and weeks five. And this was over a six-week period of time where he's going through this chemotherapy. He says over $125,000 was Build to Medicare, and that was just the treatments. He said, since then, I've had multiple PET scans, CAT scans, uh, MRIs, uh, visits with surgical oncologists, urologists, and follow-ups with oncology staff at the Sarah Canyon uh, Cancer Center. My point is, he had all these things he's responsible for. And here's what he said, uh, and this gentleman happened to be on a, um, uh, a supplemental plan, and he says, uh, the point is, I have paid an annual deductible, uh, $233 this year, and nothing more than that. He said, without Medicare and my supplemental plan, G, he said, I never could have been able to afford anything close to those costs. I was forced to retire for health reasons and live on a fixed income while the premiums for supplemental insurance are not cheap. It is manageable. And the issue is this. We're going to pay either way we go. And so this gentleman had a supplemental plan, so he paid a premium for that and did not have to worry about co-pays, co-insurance, uh, and this max out of pocket. His max out of pocket was just simply the premiums that he was paying for that particular plan. All right, now let's talk about the next one, and that would be the RX plan is included. Now, normally, 
uh, this is promoted as something that is good, and, and it can be good. And so included means that the insurance company, Advantage Company, actually selects a drug plan for you and puts a component of drug coverage within that Medicare Advantage plan. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're mediocre. And so we tell people when we take an Advantage plan, we have to make sure that we also have uh, good drug coverage because I've seen people be attracted to a zero premium plan and all the money they saved, they actually spent at the pharmacy because they did not have adequate and uh, a good uh, prescription drug coverage. So that is an issue that we have to pay attention to. That's a concern. Hey, if you come to a place where you know you're going to have to make some Medicare decisions pretty soon, the best way to do that is to click up here in this right-hand corner and you'll have an opportunity to be able to book a call with one of our Medicare guides. All the guides around here I have personally trained and they truly are professional. They'll answer your questions and they'll show you different Medicare options to make sure that you're confident in the decision that you make. All right, now number seven, uh, advantage plans are not portable. You see, Advantage plans are actually not really tied to you. They're tied to a service area. We actually have 34 service areas throughout the country. And that just simply means if I live in one state and move to another, I'm moving to a different uh, service area. Or I could be in one metropo metropolitan area and I move to another one. In other words, these plans are, uh, you don't take them with you. In fact, they just had this happen. I had a lady that lived in California, had actually had an Advantage plan that she really liked, moves to Kansas, and that Advantage plan was not available. And so what she had to do, she had to find Find another one, uh, a, a new doctor's, and a whole uh, you know different plan uh, that she was trying to find that was going to work for her. Okay, why? Because they're not portable. You don't take those with you when someone gets a supplemental plan. They're portable. You take those uh, with you wherever you are because it's a national plan. But Advantage plans are tied to a particular region. All right, and then also number six here, Advantage plans are not permanent. As a matter of fact, Advantage plans are only written for one calendar year, and that's it. And it's basically agreement between Medicare the insurance company and you. And so what uh, Medicare requires the insurance company to do is to be true to that contract for one calendar year, but then the following year, they can do whatever they want. They can improve the plan, they can decrease the plan's benefits, uh, they can actually pull the plan if it wasn't profitable for them. And so those plans are only written for one calendar year. You take a supplemental plan, it's written for life, but Advantage plans are only written for one calendar year. And then I think it's noteworthy to also talk about the perks. Now, most agents, again, and advertisements want to really promote all the perks, dental, vision, hearing, gym membership, those kinds of things. And, and those are legitimate perks and uh, can be attractive, but you also have to pay attention to some of those are going to have some restrictions. We see this a lot with the dental portion uh, of an Advantage plan. Okay, uh, Many times you have to go to certain dentist uh, and there's a network and sometimes that could be limited. So yes, you'd like to use a dental plan, but can you find a dentist that takes that or at least a dentist that you're going to be comfortable with? And sometimes uh, people struggle with that. Also hearing aids. We like the hearing aid benefit advantage plan, but again, it's going to be a network plan. So they're not going to cover all uh, hearing aids. And so you have to make sure if you want that benefit, that that is actually uh, going to meet your needs. Again, some of the perks are going to have restrictions, even the over-the-counter cards, uh, typically a retail price on those things, not, uh, not really a real attractive price. But you've got to read the fine print when it comes to restrictions because uh, you may be disappointed with some of those. And then also networks. Uh, now this to me, would be definitely an issue uh, with an Advantage plan because you're either going to be on an HMO network or a PPO network. All right. And the, the reason this matters is because you have to pick what network uh, you want to serve you. And so what happens, the difference is this HMO networks are going to be smaller than a PPO network. Now, if I was on a supplemental plan, I never have a network. I go to any doctor, any hospital that takes Medicare. But here I'm definitely going to have the issue of networks. And so with the HMO plan, I have to stay in my network unless it's an emergency situation or um, uh, an urgent care situation. Then you can go wherever you want, actually anywhere in the world. World. But if it's not urgent care or emergency, you have to stay within that HMO plan. In fact, I had a guy uh, that wrote to me from Houston uh, whose dad passed away, and he said they wanted uh, the, his dad to go to a, a provider that was about an hour away from Houston, felt like they could get proper care there, but he was on an HMO plan. The HMO plan would not approve him going out of the network. And he's, his father passed away, and in part, he blamed the Advantage plan for that. I'm not saying that's the, the cause of it. I'm just saying that's exactly how he felt. 
yourself. Now, the PPO plan, they do allow you to go out of the network, but what happens is you usually have to pay almost twice as much money. Because I've, I've owned a PPO plan, remember we talked about max out of pockets, if I stay in my network, that could be anywhere from four to 7,000. If I go out of my network, that could be anywhere from seven to $10,000. And so, yes, we have the right to do it, but it's definitely gonna cost us substantially more. So we have networks when we have advantage plans. Number three, oftentimes you're gonna see there will be referrals required, especially on the HMOs. Uh, they do require that uh, you see your primary care doctor uh, before you see a specialist. Now, PPOs normally do not require that. HMOs do. Now, a lot of people that are enrolling in HMOs because they're very attractive. Uh, they have lower co-pays and, and lower max out of pockets, and they really enrich those benefits on the HMOs. Why? So that insurance company has more control. But they also uh, are going to require that your primary care doctor agree that you need to see a specialist. You don't just pick up the phone and call a cardiologist or or go see um, uh, an uh, orthopedic doc unless your primary care doc agrees that you need that and then is going to make that referral. So you got to live with that particular restriction. Number two, you also have to qualify to switch. Now to me, this would be a huge deal. If a person goes on an advantage plan and they stay on that advantage plan for any length of a time, let's say a year, two, three, four, five years, and now they want to get off of that advantage plan and go back to original Men Medicare and get a supplemental plan, now they have to medically qualify. All but four states, which would be New York, Connecticut, Maine, and Massachusetts. Those four states, you don't have to qualify, but all the other 46 states and the District of Columbia, if I want to go back to that advantage plan now, I'm going to have to uh, medically qualify. That means I have to go through underwriting, which means from an agent standpoint, we're going to have to ask you about 30 health questions. We're going to have to check all the meds you're taking now and have for the last two years, and we take the information and submit it, usually along with a statement from your doctor, to uh, the insurance company, and it goes to their underwriting department and if they like what they see health-wise, they're not concerned about any pre-existing pre conditions, uh, and they're fine with your medications, then they can approve the case. But if they see something they don't like, any pre-existing condition, uh, any health issue, any medication they're uncomfortable with, then they have every right to deny that application, and then you'd be on that Advantage plan, really, then for the rest of your life. And the issues they deny for, folks, are not just I mean, life and death issues. I'm talking about things like rheumatoid arthritis, spinal stenosis, AFib. I mean, one AFib incident, and you'll never get to switch off those plans. And so there are health issues and medication that you could take where the insurance company says, no, we're not going to approve you to have a Medicare supplemental plan. And now you can't qualify, so you have to stay on the Advantage plan. All right. And then the last one I'm going to address, I'm actually going to read an article to you that I found very interesting because uh, it probably sounds like I'm biased here, that I'm bad mouthing advantage plans and being critical, and I'm not at all. But these are issues that oftentimes agents don't talk about, but you have to live the consequence of these things, so I'm sharing those with you. But this last one, I actually found an article that I thought would uh, very adequately and accurately describe what people have to deal with when they have to live with this whole issue of prior authorizations. So let's look at that article. Hey, if you've come to the place where you know you're going to have to make some Medicare decision pretty soon and you want to make the right one, one of the best ways to do this is to go down below and you'll see in the comment section there the very first pinned comment at the top. You can actually click on the link there and you will book a call. And you'll book a call with one of our Medicare guides. All the guides with our company, I have personally trained them. Uh, they're professional, they answer all your questions, and they'll show you your Medicare options so that you'll be confident in your decisions. Let's get back to the video. And normally when I uh, share uh, uh, these things with you uh, on our YouTube channel. I um, don't like to read articles. I just like to share with you from my heart uh, things that I've learned, things that I know to be true. But I've just felt like this article did a very good job at, at really accurately describing what I know to be true about um, prior authorizations. Uh, now, what we all have to realize is that uh, the reason that agents don't talk about this is because they don't want you to be aware of this. Why? Because when you get an advantage plan, um, uh, the agent is paid a higher commission, in fact, a much higher commission and a l much longer a residual commission. Uh, that's the way insurance works. Insurance is really all about residuals. And so um, advantage plans pay as well, double commission as well as lifetime residual. And so again, agents don't talk about this, but you need to know about this. And so again, let me read this article to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I want to highlight, I think, some of the real important things as we discuss this whole issue of what I would say would really be the number one problem with Advantage plans. So here we start. It says this, Medicare Advantage plans, which are private insurers alternative to traditional Medicare, that's why we call them replacement plans. 
have grown in popularity in recent years with 28 million Americans signing up. But they have one big problem that frustrates many enrollees as well as doctors and hospitals prior authorizations. Now, the plans, these the Advantage plans, call prior authorizations a utilization management tool designed to keep costs down. Whenever I read that, it's like, no, they're not so concerned. I don't think really keeping costs down. They're concerned about keeping profits up. <laughs> That's why they have them. But it says to keep costs down by requiring, uh, requiring, now listen to this, all Medicare Advantage members to request permission before they receive medical care. Now, keep in mind, you can see your primary care doctor without prior authorization. You can go get some basic lab work without prior authorization. So every service you have is not going to require prior, prior authorization. However, statistically, they say right now that between 70 to 72 percent of all the services that someone needs on Advantage Plan is going to require a prior authorization, this permission uh, to be able to get this health care service. Let's keep going. It says if a plan determines the requested care would be unnecessary, or could be provided for less money elsewhere, it can and will deny the request. Okay, then it goes on to state uh, that the, there's a U.S. Health and Human Service Inspector General report found widespread and persistent problems related to denials of care and payment. And I know that to be true as an agent in this business. It is widespread uh, in these areas. They go on to say there's been some attention around the fact that prior authorization is not serving people. Who's it serving? It's serving the health insurance companies, and people are mad about it. Many physicians and hospitals are mad about Medicare Advantage prior authorization policies, too. Why? They have to employ extra staff to, to, to uh, take care of this. They have to uh, consult an insurance company that has a right to interfere. That's why they're mad about it. And they find the requirements really burdensome and oner 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 onerous. Okay, then you go on to say traditional Medicare doesn't require prior authorizations for medical care. In other words, when someone has A and B in a supplemental plan, there's never an opportunity for the insurance company to interfere because they don't uh, have this requirement of prior authorizations. If Medicare says they'll cover it and doctor says you need it, end of story, the supplemental company has no say-so whatsoever. So that's what they're talking about with that statement. Let's keep going. In theory, prior authorization should prevent doctors and hospitals from prescribing unnecessary procedures. Again, theory. But in reality, it often keeps people from getting medical care uh, their doctors recommend and leads them to pay more for their health problems and concerns. And an interesting article that I read not long ago was a doctor who was talking about the problem of prior authorization saying, hey, I have to have an insurance company uh, to approve whatever I'm recommending. So who's practicing medicine here? Am I doing it or the insurance company? And clearly, the insurance company has a final say so, and they only have a medical license to do that. But that's what happens with prior authorizations. Let's keep going. Nearly all medical, excuse me, nearly all Medicare Advantage enrollees, 99% of them, are in plans requiring prior authorizations. Often, the prior authorization is, far more exp is for more expensive services. Again, you know, your MRIs, um, uh, those kinds of things, expensive services, or being transferred from a hospital to a skilled nursing facility. Okay, that's expensive. Or might I add, because I've seen this happen before, uh, getting to stay in an, a skilled nursing facility until you're healthy enough uh, to go home. Sometimes they're, they're discharged uh, too quickly. I've seen that happen before. Um, and then they go on to say an American Medicare Medical Rehabilitation Providers Association called AMPRA here, uh, their survey of rehab hospitals and units found, listen to this, that MA plans overrule rehabilitation physicians' judgment 53% of the time, <laughs> over half. Often it involves whether someone in the hospital can be moved to a rehab facility for treatment. Why? Because it's so expensive. And this report called prior authorizations a widespread and common problem that can harm Patients, millions of Medicare Advantage members see their prior authorizations requests denied each year. Uh, there's a gentleman here by the name of David Lipschitz. He's the associate director of the, of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Uh, he says prior authorizations are endemic, meaning they're you know very problematic. They're common. Medicare Advantage prior authorization denial rates are increasing, says this gentleman, especially at skilled nursing facilities and in home health settings. He says that's because some plans have been hiring subcontractors, now listen, and using algorithms to make these decisions. Not the doctor, not the provider, but rather a computer making the final decision. And I know that to be true. Prior authorization is touted by Medicare Advantage plans as a way to ensure that people don't get unnecessary care and get appropriate care. 
I say it's because they're protecting their profits, but often it serves as a significant barrier to care and leads to denial or premature termination of coverage for things that would otherwise be covered under traditional Medicare. In 2022, American, uh, the AMA uh, surveyed 94% of the 1,001 doctors that they polled said prior authorizations delayed medical care. Roughly a third said it led to a serious adverse event for a patient. I mean, they delayed it so long that they couldn't get uh, the proper care. It was denied. And that's sad. Prior authorization roadblocks have led some older Americans to leave their Medicare Advantage plan. They say roughly one in five who left those plans cited problems getting the plan to cover medical services. In some cases, this gentleman said, we have seen plans give nonsensical reasons or justification for turning down coverage. And then there was an uh, HHS Inspector General report in 2022 said these denials can delay or prevent beneficiary access to medically necessary care, lead beneficiaries to pay out of pocket for services that should be covered or are covered by Medicare, therefore should be covered by the Advantage plan, but don't, or create an administrative burden for beneficiaries or their providers who choose to appeal the denial. The denials, the Inspector General noted, may be particularly harmful for beneficiaries who cannot afford to pay for services directly and for critically ill beneficiaries who may suffer negative health consequences from delayed or denied care. Very few Medicare Advantage beneficiaries whose prior authorization requests are denied bother to appeal. Uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation said just 11% will actually take the time to appeal. Others don't want to deal with the bureaucracy uh, and uh, forms and delays in the appeal process. Even though many times they would be successful, they don't attempt that appeal. I always say, why should they have to appeal in the first place? If they had A and B in a supplemental plan, they would not even have to worry about that. Let's keep going. Now, prior authorizations uh, are gradually changing. We know that to be true. In fact, some states here, they mentioned Louisiana, Michigan, and Texas have passed prior authorization laws in recent years on behalf of their state's residents and health care providers. Why? Because of the abuse that happens in this system. Now, more than two dozen other states are considering similar legislation. In April, the Biden administration released new stricter prior authorization rules rules to help Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. Why? Again, this widespread problem. Now, this gentleman we've talked to about earlier, he says he wishes the Biden administration had also required more shared decision making by doctors and hospitals in prior authorization determinations and more stringent requirements for MA plans to tell enrollees what their prior authorization rules and criteria are. In other words, make that disclosure. Well, agents aren't going to do that because they don't want you to know about that. The rule, he notes, doesn't prohibit Medicare Advantage plans from using algorithms to reject prior authorization requests. And again, that's something that they should stop using, but they continue to use. Okay, now, what can be done in the meantime? They'll wrap this up. If you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, this article goes on to say, or considering joining one, the only way to learn about its prior authorizations practices is to ask doctors and hospitals in the plans network. Again, an agent's not going to tell you about this. You'll want to ask your medical providers how often the plans reject their care recommendations and why. The answers may make you want to reconsider where and how to get your Medicare coverage, meaning what? A and B and a supplemental plan. Now, will the new pre-authorization rules and policies have a notable impact on the number of Medicare Advantage members prevented from receiving the urgent Medicare care they need? Well, the truth is only time will tell. And sad to say, not everyone has time on their side, especially when they're ill. So herein is the risk uh, that you have to take if you're going to have an advantage plan. Yeah, there's some perks and there's some things that are attractive about them. But this one issue primarily is the big problem I have, and I feel uncomfortable personally with taking that risk going on Medicare. I still have about two years before that's going to happen, but I just want you to know that if you stay on that advantage plan for any length of time and your health changes and now you have to medically qualify to get off that, now you have to live in this pre-authorization system for the rest of your life. And I'm just saying for me personally, I would not want to take that risk. The perks that are offered by the Advantage plan would simply not be worth it to me. All right. Now, I'm going to close with this. And I've had things like this written to me before. This, I think, really says it quite well as we're talking about this topic. This lady writes to me and just says, Dear Marvin, just wanted to thank you for all your med uh, Medicare YouTube presentations. They're professional, easy to understand, especially for seniors, and your sincerity is always shown through. So she says, You've taught me invaluable information, which I should be forever grateful. And there's how she closes. I lost my husband in August of 2022 due to a premature discharge from a skilled nursing uh, facility from an Advantage plan. He was 74 years old. The lady from San Francisco, California. 
and that's what happens. Why? Because in order to stay in that skilled nursing facility, that advantage plan had to continue to agree to pay. And they said, no, we're not going to pay anymore. Algorithm says, no, it's time for him to go. He was discharged and he goes home and passes away. Now, again, I'm not blaming the skilled nursing facility for that, but she obviously realizes there was some responsibility in that premature discharge. Okay. Now, listen, in closing, I am not trying to uh, persuade you to uh, not get an advantage plan. If that's your uh, uh, option and that's the very best for you and you're making that decision, then I would definitely go for that. But I do think that you should um, know about these items. And for me personally, I would be concerned about these kind of things because why? Once we make that decision, uh, sometimes we it cannot be reversed and so we have to live with the consequence of that choice and we just want to make sure that you're happy with your coverage.